Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you to all of you troopers that were here late last night and then have come this morning. And uh, I just hope that you have plenty of caffeine in you because this is going to be getting into the weeds a little bit. And it's about a few subjects that uh, so many folks don't really understand, but it's important that you do. And the reason that it's important that you do is that when you think about what's really being offered right now in terms of plans and, and systems of government and so forth, it's um, not necessarily what you think it is. And uh, there's a lot of deception going on. So let's go ahead and let's stand and read the Lord's Word this morning together. This is from Ecclesiastes 1, 4 through 9. A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind. And on its circuits, the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full, to the place where streams flow. There they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. You may be seated. There is nothing new under the sun. There is nothing really that we see that has not been tried before in some sort of context. Sometimes what you do see, though, and there's a very popular term that many of us have heard. It's called gain of function, right? And we were talking about viruses and those sorts of things. So gain of function would be something to where you have something that starts off bad, and maybe there's a number of other things that are, are pernicious, let's say. There's other things that are um, going to work in the worst way to the, to the end goal. If you're combining viruses, let's say, that you're taking something that is dangerous, something that is communicable, something that is as well maybe attacks one part of the body and then the other part of the body. And before too long, you get a system that works well to be able to be released. And much like that, we have some ideas and concepts that are viral in nature. Well, let me take us back to somebody that we looked at yesterday. Everybody recognizes Klaus Schwab. And here's what Klaus went ahead and announced back in 2020 in the summer. At this pivotal moment, I see several priorities for the global agenda. We must continue to fight against the global pandemic. We must revitalize the global economy and accelerate its transition to net zero. We must preserve biodiversity by deploying nature-based solutions, and we must narrow the gap between the rich and the poor to achieve more sustainable global development. So what you have from Klaus Schwab here is the announcement that we need to accelerate things to net zero. And this is in 2020, because what they did is they used the idea and the concept and the panic and as well the authoritarian control of COVID to immediately transition into a climate crisis. Now everything has to change. Because of this that we are doing now that is helping us to be able to control things, we're gonna come out on the other side of this with an entirely new way of doing things as we accelerate to 2030. So we're taking a look at a 10-year plan a 10-year plan to change everything. Well, what exactly is that all about? But first of all, who was the man to first introduce the current manifestation of the Great Reset? And I say the current manifestation because the Great Reset is really just another year zero or year one type of proposal. Of course, Robespierre and the Jacobins would talk about year one 
at the cultural, not the, sorry, it's cultural, the French Revolution. You would as well have Pol Pot talk about coming to year zero, where everything in history changes. In the French Revolution, they basically changed everything. I mean, they killed the king, they, they killed Marie uh, Antoinette, they, they, they basically went through this entire process of making sure that whatever was will not be again. So you're resetting history. So all of a sudden, it wasn't Madame and Monsieur, it was citizen. All of a sudden, you couldn't gather together in groups of large groups because, you know, unfortunately, something could happen. There could be a revolution that's sparked or a counter-revolution that is sparked that would stop what they're doing to really reform France. And so most of what happened in the terror of the French Revolution was by way of the Committee on Public Safety. Because it's for your safety, as they've already gotten rid of the social contract that you had before. That's more or less what's going on now. But think for a second. Who was it that was the first person to announce the Great Reset, officially? And, and not Richard Florida back in 2009 with his book, The Great Reset. This is something completely different. Well, Klaus Schwab came off the stage at Davos in early 2020, in January of 2020. This is before everybody locked down. And the person who walked up was, can you guess it? That time, Prince Charles, King Charles. He came up to announce a need to go ahead and reset this world and to go for more sustainable development and so forth. Now, you look above his head, there's a crown. What is that crown? Well, first of all, I want to let you know this. A year later, Prince Charles, now King Charles, came out with what is known as the terracotta. And we're not talking about terracotta in terms of what you do on the outside of a building or the inside of a building. We're talking about replacing the Magna Carta with the terracotta. In other words, that it's the Earth's rights first. That's what's important, before man's rights. So you see this crown above his head, and it is the 17 sustainability goals of the United Nations and the World Economic Forum. That's what he was here to help you know, that we are going to reset this world. And what we are moving towards is something that Dr. Lindsay spoke about last night, is that we're moving towards degrowth. So, this is the, from the royal family, what they released in the late spring, early summer of 2020. We have an incredible opportunity to create entirely new sustainable industries, investing in nature as the true engine of our economy. The current global crisis has disrupted every aspect of our lives. But it has also presented us with an extraordinary opportunity, a chance to reset and accelerate efforts to improve the state of our world. Changing our current trajectory will require bold and imaginative action, together with determination and decisive leadership. In order to secure our future and to prosper, we need to evolve our economic model, putting people and planet at the heart of global value creation. If there is one critical lesson we have to learn from this crisis, we need to put nature at the heart of how we operate. We are on the verge of catalytic breakthroughs that will alter our view of what is possible and profitable within the framework of a sustainable future. We need nothing short of a paradigm shift, one that inspires action at revolutionary levels and pace. We simply cannot waste any more time. The only limit is our willingness to act. And the time to act is now. So you see there, there's at the end, all of the colors that come from this fleur de lac, if you will, or this crown that he's created, are all the colors of the 17 sustainability goals 
of the United Nations and the World Economic Forum. And it's the royal family that's involved with this. And not only this, but you take a look at the Netherlands, and you would see that folks that are part of the royal family of Netherlands are part of groups like the Club of Rome and are showing up at Bilderberg and as well the World Economic Forum and so forth. So what is actually happening here? And this is one of the things that we got to talk about, is that both from the left and the right, from the left side of what we see happening in the world in terms of taking things completely woke, of taking things sustainable, of really trying to make sure that you end our rights and end our inalienable rights and end our ability to, to make a living, to be independent, to actually have liberty. That's happening from folks that are on the left and the right. But what you are experiencing is called degrowth. So what is degrowth? This was something that James Lindsay posted up last night on Twitter. And degrowth broadly means shrinking rather than growing economies. So we use less of the world's energy and resources and put well-being ahead of profit. Well, that depends on what you mean by well-being. The idea is that by pursuing degrowth policies, economies can help themselves, their citizens, and the planet by becoming more sustainable. So what, you're talk what they're talking about is, let's end this entire idea of maybe the way most of you have lived your lives, to where you're trying to plan out your life through your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, your 70s. You're planning retirement. You're planning on well, I'm going to invest in this house and I'm going to put money in savings and I'm going to invest in this and I'm going to do these things that will help me and my family and I'll be able to pass that on. Well, that's something that is not really encouraged. And so what you're experiencing is an attempt to shrink our economy, our economic power, and transition the United States into the fractured states of America and into the economic system known as distributism. That's what this is. Distributism is not the end goal. Pure socialism through Marxism is the end goal eventually by the time we get to 2050. One of the reasons that you're doing this is because they're thinking, okay, well, everything's going to be automated in the future. So when you talk about going into McDonald's right now, how many employees are in some McDonald's? Maybe two or three? Because now you're doing all of your ordering at a smart device, let's say, that they have on a panel and then you go up and you receive your food, right? This is the way it's being done in a lot of restaurants now. You make your order, then someone brings that food to you. And as we continue on this process of automation, we're taking the human element out of things. And what we're doing is we're bringing in an entirely new way of living. So what you're doing is you're inventing what's called the creative class. And the creative class are those folks that don't have jobs, but they're really creative online. They have Instagram accounts. They have TikTok accounts. They do all sorts of things that other people appreciate when they're online. As long as you're staying within the rules and as well the, the ideologies that the state wants you to have, but not just the state. Because a big part of this, when you take a look at King Charles, what is one of his titles? Yes, he's King Charles, but he is the defender of faith. It used to be the defender of the faith, but now it's the defender of faith. Because if you want to talk about people that are actually active in faith in the UK right now, it wouldn't necessarily be the Christians. If you go into the churches in Scotland, if you go into the churches in England and Wales and so forth, you won't see packed churches, packed Presbyterian churches, and packed Anglican churches, and no, you'll see packed mosques. You'll see Baha'i temples that are packed. So now he's the defender of faith. So what you have is something that's ecumenical that's happening, but there's a movement towards distributism. And what you'll see is, as today we're going to be discussing integralism on the left. Can someone get that phone for me, please? As we're talking about integralism on the left, what you really have is on the left side, this is happening through the World Economic Forum and all their faith partners, but on the right side, something else has been happening for several years. But they're both kind of working for the same thing. This is one of the reasons I think that you kind of have guys like Andrew Torba, 
who is the CEO of Gab, a social media company, who's now basically telling everybody, yeah, we need to balkanize, right? Fracture the United States. And you need to, he's really good on Amish, man. The Amish have it down. We really need to look at how they're doing things. So if you had somebody that was conservative, that was trying to encourage people to keep capitalism and keep on doing what we're doing and making sure that we keep the economic structures that we have, he wouldn't be so great on the Amish. You know, let's get rid of electricity. Let's live, live in simple communities and so forth and almost in our, I don't know, safe spaces, our autonomous zones where you had during 2020, during all the riots, you had the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. Do you remember that in Seattle? Where in Seattle they had this four block area or two block area and nobody else could come in and we're calling it Chaz, you know, our autonomous zone. Well, basically that's what you're talking about doing with Christians. So what is distributism? Distributism is an economic theory asserting that the world's productive assets should be widely owned rather than concentrated. So in other words, that everybody's kind of a stakeholder, let's say, in everything. You know, not just shareholder economy, but more stakeholder. And that there is distribution. Now, this, this concept was pushed by G.K. Chesterton and Bullock as well. They were called the Chester Bullock kind of explanation for things. Remember that Chesterton was a Roman Catholic. And what he was looking back at is a, is a system known as integralism and as well distributism through a couple of other concepts as well. So I want to explain to you the word subsidiarity. We're going to talk about this a lot tomorrow, but go ahead and take a picture if you need to. And just to kind of get this down so we discuss this more in length tomorrow that it doesn't get too confusing for you. So subsidiarity is a community of a higher order. A community of higher order should not interfere in the internal life of a community of a lower order, depriving the latter of its functions, but rather should support it in case of need and help to coordinate its activity with the activities of the rest of society, always with a view to the common good. Okay, so you're going to hear a lot about common good Christianity tomorrow and possibly even today in some of the other presentations. So don't forget that. And what is this really talking about? It's talking about cuius regio eius religio, whose realm, their region. <clears throat> so when you're talking about balkanizing or splitting up the United States, how many of you heard people talking about, we need a national divorce, right? You've heard that which is the last thing that we should be after right now. You need to go from the blue states to the red states. Well, what happens with people that are in red states that are blue? They go there. What you end up having is fracturing. So then what you, you have is a yes, kind of a loose federal concept, but you have states that are becoming sovereign in and of themselves, apart from the federal whole, but as well, you're having concentrations of people that as well you're going to split up and make even smaller regions. And one thing that you can look at is the Fabian window. And that's in London, at the London School of Economics. It's made by George Bernard Shaw. And what you have is George Bernard Shaw hammering on the world. And the concept is to fracture it into bits, the world, and then mold it nearer to thine heart's desire. So divide and rule, divide and conquer is always done the same way. You fracture everything, and then you mold it closer to what you really want in the end. But first, you have to get rid of what was the hegemony, what was the, the constitution, what was the social contract with people, if you have an end goal in mind. But this term especially would be known in terms of, of what they decided at the Peace of Augsburg in 1555, because the Reformation was taking place. As well, you had the Radical Reformation too. And there was a lot of chaos happening in the Holy Roman Empire. So eventually, to try to quell things, they came up with, or they, they resorted to this concept of whom's realm will their religion. But what happened right after that? It wasn't too far after that that you had the Thirty Years' War, because this all broke down. And in the Thirty Years' War, I mean, you had hundreds of thousands of people killed. That was when things really got bad, but then led to what? After that, we get to the peace of Westphalia, where you have the concept of Westphalian sovereignty. 
And that's really what they're all about winding back, is Westphalian sovereignty. That's what this is all about. That's why I named my organization Sovereign Nations. So when they talk about, well, we got to do the right thing, we got to crush the liberals, and we got to, or on the left side, you know, we have to do the right thing, we need to get rid of these liberal ideas of, because they're both illiberal concepts. So what we are in the midst of is refactoring, the refactoring of subsidiarity. So the way that we have things now in the United States, they want to go much more regional and concentrated, and as well, basically weaken the United States in terms of what we can do. So let's just get down to the nuts and bolts. Well, what is integralism? And it really goes back to Catholic integralism. Catholic integralism is a tradition of thought that rejecting the liberal separation of politics from concern with the end of human life holds that a political rule must order man to his final goal. Since, however, man has both a temporal and eternal end, integralism holds that there are two powers that rule him, a temporal power and a spiritual power. And since man's temporal end is subordinated to his eternal end, the, the temporal power must be subordinated to the spiritual power. So when you're looking at this from the Catholic perspective, the conservative Catholic perspective, you know what this kind of ends to. The, the ends are what you would see in you know, a lot of the monarchies that you had throughout Europe. And as well, then in the modern way of doing it, when you would see the popes, of course, kind of agree in the 1800s, and we'll get into this a little bit tomorrow, that there needs to be something else besides this idea that individual liberty and sovereignty of individuals, this is crazy. We can't allow people to make their own decisions because this is one of the things that, yeah, the Protestant Reformation really messed up for everybody. And they'll say that, oh, there are 39,000 denominations of Protestantism, which is nonsense, although it might be by the next few years because we're fracturing and splitting so much. But this would be the concept is that you have all of this fracturing, all of this division and so forth. What we need to do is come back and be unified under one whole. Now, for those of you that are thinking in a conservative term, you're thinking, well, maybe we can do some of that on the conservative side, but it means that we're going to have to give up some of our inalienable rights. But, you know, maybe that's what we need to do to stop the woke. Well, let me tell you, this is what I heard that they were going to do back in 2011. So I knew that one of the focuses of this would not just be integralism, but it would be Christian nationalism. And Christian nationalism is basically an overarching Protestant way of being able to be part of the integralist system. So you're looking at ecumenical integralism. So there is an attempt to create a form of progressive ecumenical integralism, rejecting the liberal separation of politics from concern with the end of human life, and it holds that political rule must order man to his final goal. Since, however, man has both a temporal and an eternal end, ecumenical integralism holds that there are two powers that rule him, a temporal power and a spiritual power. In many ways, ecumenical integralism is a unification of those who espouse post-liberal or illiberal thought and practice. Now, there are two different sides of this. You have the left side, which could be represented by what you see at the United Nations and the World Economic Forum. That side could be demonstrated by what the Roman Catholic Church is currently doing through their Pontifex Maximus, Pope Francis. I didn't say Maximus, I said Maximus. So where you see a very Marxist-leaning pope, a pope that is going along with anything, basically, that Klaus Schwab and a lot of other folks will say. Sometimes he'll hedge a little bit back, but then you see him with Lady Rothschild and others to be part of this inclusive capitalism idea and so forth, which, again, is stakeholder politics, a stakeholder economy, I should say. But you see that on the left, but then you see it on the right, which we will be talking about tomorrow, with groups like national conservatism and Yoram Hazoni, of which you have the major Christian nationalists a part of. So those are the folks that are very, very conservative but illiberal. But guess what? The ones on the left, they're not liberal in terms of allowing you to have individual freedom. They're the ones that came up with all the ideas about locking down and obeying the government and so forth and making sure that you as well are moving towards a very bizarre future. The end of things that we talked about last night of, of what makes a man or a woman 
what makes truth in terms of an objective stance. This is creating the third leg of the stool. It's a three-legged stool strategy. So first you have the public sector role, right, which would be governance, right? So who you elect into office or who is <laughs> selected into office for your top-down move. And then a private sector role, which would be all the corporations and folks that would go along with this. So when you have a corporate side and a government side that are now working together for governance, what is that called? Corporatism. What's another word for that? Benice, yes, Benito Mussolini called it fascism. But you're adding in a third leg of the stool, a moral component. And that's what you would call integralism. But this is where we were going through when we were talking about these things yesterday. It's the dialectic at work. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. That's the basic flow. Problem, reaction, solution. You create the problem. You also create the reaction to that problem to get to the solution that you want. You're not just creating the problem. You also have to make sure that you control the reaction. One of our jobs that we've had over the past six years was to create the actual reaction a reaction that we should have, of which, by the way, I've been warning everybody that I talk to about wokeness and critical race theory, be careful of Christian nationalism. You don't want to go down that road. That's a trap being set for you. But so many of the people that I spoke to went down that road. I've got a guy sitting in the back row over here, Mark Graham. He knows I've been talking to him about this stuff for eight, nine years. Sometimes I think he's looking across the table at me going, I think you're a little crazy there, Mike. You know, remember we were talking about 2017 you yesterday? But then all of a sudden it started to happen. It's not because I'm smarter than anybody else. It's because I was sitting in the rooms as this stuff was being talked about 10, 12 years ago. And eventually it dawned on me that these people were serious. They're going to actually do this. But it starts with the problem. So think of it this way. You start with the woke. You start with the creating of this radical subjectivism that you're injecting into everything. And one of the things that we're very much concerned about is you're injecting it into faith, of which you saw it coming into the Southern Baptist Convention. You had it going into the Presbyterian Church of America, which is the conservative side of Presbyterians. You had it going into Moody Bible Institute, Dallas Theological Seminary, Reformed Theological Seminary, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. You have it going into the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. You have it going into everywhere. You have it basically being spread by the Gospel Coalition. It was through everyone. And the Catholic Church, of course, was pumping it. They've been pumping this stuff in for years. That's how I was first exposed to it about 30 years ago. But you create the problem, then you create the reaction. Well, what is the reaction to it? It's the right side. You start the left side, then you have the right side, and then eventually, because both the left and the right are both saying, we want the same things. We need to get rid of all these inalienable rights. We need to get rid of our current constitution. That's garbage anyway. We need a new social contract. So then you come up with your solution. Totalitarianism. Problem, reaction, solution. Create the problem, create or encourage the reaction, and then your predetermined solution is realized. Well, guess who's getting in the way? Who's getting in the way are the speakers that you have here today. And one of the problems is, even though there's a lot of pastors, evangelists, celebrity people in the Christian realm that kind of after we begged them, and I begged them, and James Lindsay informed them, and I informed them for years, that critical race theory was coming into the church, it was coming into every facet of our life, that they would stand against critical race theory, but they wouldn't exactly talk about who was the one that brought it in. Because you basically have a game going on. You want to make sure those honorariums continue. But the problem is, is that when you try to talk to them about, well, you know, I understand that one of the end goals here is, is distributism, getting rid of capitalism, all these dreams that you have of what you want. 
and you know whether it's building of schools and building of you know all these different programs and making a massive organization right now you need to be focused on one thing and that's stopping this and evangelization evangelization first with the gospel and stopping this from happening so you got to talk about it so unfortunately we have an 11th commandment that everybody is basically following right now you can't say a name like albert moeller who is responsible for a lot of this you can't say a name like, oh, forgive me, because we're in Clearwater, Florida, Willie Rice, who was pushing white fragility from his pulpit. Seriously. And that man was one step away from becoming the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. So you create the problem. Infuse every level of society with critical race theory. Insist on diversity, equity, inclusion, compliance. Attempt to normalize transsexual lifestyles. Introduce drag queen story hour. Now think about it. If any of you are on social media, you saw something from another drag queen story hour or some drag queen dancing in front of children every day on social media, right? For months and months and months. There would have been no opportunity for you to be able to have that kind of reaction to it if it wasn't for social media. So all of a sudden, something that's happening in, in Kansas or something that's happening in New York or Detroit, you're getting on your phone or on your laptop each day, and everybody, of course, it is problematic. This is something that should be stopped by legal means. Notice that whenever they're taking the videos, that you, they always make sure that you saw the, the heads of the children in the shot as you're watching some man dancing around a lingerie. They always made sure that they had that to make sure that you reacted in the way that you, because they're trying to provoke you into action. Suppress free speech. So what's happening is, throughout this whole problem is what's happening is that we're even self-censoring ourselves. This was talked about yesterday. You're careful about what you put on Facebook. Well, that'll get me banned. Well, that'll get me taken down from Twitter and so forth. So you start to self-censor. But they are censoring as well. Disinformation, misinformation, just whatever it is that disagrees with what they're trying to do to create the problem is something that needs to be censored. But you create the reaction encourage wild-eyed conspiracy theories, like things that are way beyond what's actually happening. Encourage violent extremism. Encourage white identitarianism. So where you had identity politics on the left, now you're creating identity politics on the right. Anti-Semitism is on the rise everywhere. Encourage talk about secession, or sedition, that's seditious talk. Suppress free speech. And even talk about stealing elections that what we need to do is we need to do what the left does, and we need to steal our own elections. That's not the goal. That shouldn't be where you're at. But you're trying to get to your predetermined solution. Declare those who oppress you and what you're doing enemies of the state. Fracture and balkanize America, the big sort. And the big sort was a, a book that was written by Bill Bishop, but it's been a plan for many years. It's one of the purposes of social media is to break everybody up into affinity groups, into micro groups that they identify with, as opposed to living in a community where we've got to get along with everybody that's in our neighborhood, right? We've got to get along with everybody that's at Publix when we go over to shop, you know? But they're talking about creating this big sort. So what happens to the gospel, Christians, if we're only allowed to be in one area where we have our safe space? What if you can't go and preach in the blue spaces? Let's say that, yeah, you can't really preach the gospel in California or New York anymore. And remember that Florida was a few thousand votes from going from red to blue in 2018, when Andrew Gillum almost won the governorship. Do you remember that? DeSantis did not win by a landslide in 2018. The former vice president of Open Societies Foundations, George Soros' foundation, almost won the election to be the governor of Florida. That's how close it was. So don't think that we just have this red band-aid in Florida. But what you are seeing is that blue states are getting bluer. You're creating a fracture. Look, lock conservatives and Christian nationalists out of the state economy if you're in a blue state. That's going to be happening. But Christian nationalism is never a term that you should be embracing. Limit freedom of movement of those that oppose the state. Marginalize those that wish to preserve the Constitution from society. And that'll be happening on the, both the left and the right. 
This is a great reset of faith. So again, it's top-down, getting your people in, into the elected positions that you want. It's bottom-up, by creating movements within groups of people online, by, by people gathering together now on conferences and so forth and saying, we have to stop this idea of liberty, it's killing us. Uh, Yoram Hazoni was basically saying, it's a failed project, this whole idea of liberty. And what you need to do as well, work it from the inside out. You need to reinforce your postmodern change in faith, cultural events and community gatherings. When I say postmodern, postmodernism is being used on both the left and the right. And one of the reasons that I'm here at this church is because I walked in here and sat down and the pastor of this church was preaching a message on why you need to reject postmodernism and neo-Marxism. That's why I gave him a bear hug up here. Because I usually would go and look for reformed churches, those that soteriologically line up with what my beliefs are and so forth, but there are new fault lines that are being made. And the thing is, is that the majority of reformed churches around the area are pushing neo-Marxism and all these other concepts. Well, even the non-reformed churches are doing the same thing. So it's been everybody. This is what's been happening. Let's talk about Brazilian integralism. We were talking about integralism. So this is called integralismo. Now, you look at some of these images, and if your eyes aren't that good, or maybe you're sitting near the back, you might think like, oh my gosh, well, that looks like Nazi Germany, right? Well, that's more or less what it was. It was Brazilian fascism, but it was integralism because you had the corporate side and you had the governance side, which was fascistic, blending with Roman Catholicism. And one of the things that you could say is that, well, Salgado, not so much, but more so from some of the others that were in integralism in Brazil, is that anti-Semitism comes along with it. So there was a very strong anti-Semitic feeling. You would see this as well. Can you think of some other well-known country that employed integralism in their governance in the late, late 19, well, more 1940 to 1945, would be France, Vichy France, when it was taken over by the Nazis. They imposed integralism. That was the system. Brazilian integralismo was illiberal in political outlook and took a very hard stand against communism and Marxism, even though it was as well a totalitarian movement. In many ways, Intergalismo promoted clerical fascism. And one of the most famous examples is Dom Helder Camara. Finally got to it, James. <laughs> Dom Helder Camara. He was ordained a priest in 1931 with direct authorization of the Holy See, the papacy, over his young age. Camara was named Auxiliary Bishop of Rio de Janeiro by Pope Pius XII on March 3rd, 1952. Now, curious thing about Dom Helder Camaro, he's from Recife, Brazil. We have someone else that was from Recife, Brazil that's well known, and that's Paulo Ferreri. And Paulo Ferreri was, was the man who was responsible for really creating this critical consciousness going into the educational system that we have really across the Western world today. Both from the same area. So here's a man, Dom Helder Camara, who in his early years as a priest was a supporter of the fascist socialist organization, Intergalismo. Because within this, remember, when you take a look at national socialism, you take a, look, take a look at fascism, there is a socialist element in this. Which while being fascist and corporatist, held opposition between materialism, understood by him as the normal operation of natural laws guided by blind necessity, and spiritualism, the belief in God, in the immortality of the soul, and in the conditioning of individual existence to superior superior eternal goals. So you have this movement that's come into Brazil. Maybe many of you didn't even know this, that this existed, that this was happening in Brazil back then. But this was the political movement that took over Brazil. So there was great control. There was this move of being able to control the economy, morally control the people as well into what would be the desires of the government. Let's talk more about Dom Helder Camara because he's a very influential man. In many ways, he created catechesis that would support these concepts. 
But during his tenure, Kamara was informally called the Bishop of the Slums for his clear position on the side of the urban poor. And this would be kind of as they transitioned out of integralism into other governmental forms. With other clerics, he encouraged peasants to free themselves from their covenant, their con, con, I'm sorry, to free themselves from their conventional fatalistic outlook by studying the Gospels in small groups and proposing the search for social change in their readings. He was active in the formation of the Brazilian Bishops' Conference in 1952 and served as its first general secretary until 1964. He attended all four sessions of Vatican II, being active in helping to draft several portions. Kamara was one of the primary organizers of the Pact of the Catacombs. The Pact of the Catacombs happened about the same time that Vatican II was happening. And what that was, was they gathered all of these radical bishops and priests and so forth down in the catacombs of Rome. You know, under, has anybody been to the catacombs before here? Well, you know what I'm talking about. That's where they got together. And this is one of the things that the Pact of the Catacombs stated. It said, conscious of the demands of justice and charity and their mutual relationship, we will seek to transform essential activities into social works based on justice and charity, which take into account all that this requires as a humble service, service of the competent public organs. We will do our utmost so that those responsible for our government and for our public services make and put into practice laws, structures, and social institutions required by justice and charity, equality, and the harmonic and holistic development of all men and women, and by this means, bring about the advent of another social order worthy of the sons and daughters of mankind and of God. To bring about the advent of another social order. You have to think about what they were up to. Kamara was known as the Red Bishop due to his condemnation of the anti-communist stance of the U.S. and his praise of Mao Zedong during the Cultural Revolution, which claimed millions of lives. Why do you think one of the reasons that we started this conference was talking about Maoism? Kamara identified himself as a socialist and not as a Marxist, just like a lot of folks that were part of what were the Nazis again? They were the National Socialists. That's right. And while disagreeing with Marxism, had Marxist sympathies. He stated, my socialism is special. It's a socialism that respects the human person and goes back to the Gospels. My socialism, it is justice. He said concerning Marx that while he disagreed with his conclusions, he agreed with his analysis of the capitalist society. Dom Helder Camaro had a tremendous respect Tremendous amount, of, and a tremendous amount of respect and influence on Bergoglio. Well, who's that? Well, Bergoglio was Pope Francis. Dom Helder Camara, as well, had a tremendous impact on another young man in the early 1970s. A man who would soon be gathering both world leaders and corporate leaders to, dis to disrupt and dismantle the world to reset civilization. Do you know who that man was? I, I give you one example which for me was probably a crucial moment in my life. I traveled for the first time uh, to Brazil. I met a priest uh, who was known at that time as the priest of the poor people. Hmm. Uh, his name was Don Elder Camara. And he brought me to the favelas of uh, Recife and I was so shocked and I said I have to invite this bishop to Davos mm. to tell the people what poverty is. So I invited him to, to, to the annual meeting in Davos but some when I came back in Switzerland I found out that actually he was forbidden at that time Ooh. to speak in Switzerland because he was considered to be a communist and I said this is for me a test but then I noticed that many companies told me, if you invite this person who is so much against business, we will not come to Davos anymore. And that's where I had to stand to my values. Yeah. Even at the risk 
so that I would have to give up uh, the World Economic Forum. Wow. Um, but it went very well. Uh, I have to say, um, the audience in Davos listened to him. So Klaus Schwab, the leader of the World Economic Forum, his greatest influence was Dumhelder Kamara. Isn't that interesting? From integralism, which was a corporate government, fascistic with elements of socialism, rule of government, now that's going to be kind of infused into what he's going to be doing at the World Economic Forum. And he had Dumhelder Kamara as one of his primary speakers at the World Economic Forum in the early 1970s. Because this is something you need to understand. This is not a secular movement, what's happening around you right now. What's happening around you right now that we know as wokeism is not secular. It's not liberal. It's very illiberal. It's a faith system. This is from Klaus Schwab. He says, values cannot be justified by the intellectual process alone. Faith must be involved. And faith has always been involved at the World Economic Forum. This is their grid, but if you remember, yesterday I showed you their circle of influence, if you will, their logistics wheel from the World Economic Forum on the Great Reset. Well, this is the role of religion at the World Economic Forum. That the role of religion is to basically come in and impact social movements, to infuse faith into global development, to, in, to basically infuse their understanding of religion in ethics and law, and even in what gender norms are and roles. So what you do is you infiltrate the institutions. So you, you have Gramsci many years ago, 100 years ago, in his prison notebooks talking about how we need to infiltrate the institutions. You had Rudy Deutschke saying the same thing. You have Herbert Marcuse saying the same thing, that we need to infiltrate the institutions and bring this progressive, really Gnostic idea and concept in. Is everybody here familiar with the ancient heresy known as Gnosticism, for the most part? Sea of hands? Okay, good. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. Well, so you want to know how far this goes. This is from 2009, maybe 2008, but this is a panel of faith leaders at the World Economic Forum. So you're going to see Tony Blair, the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Fabian Socialist, by the way. You're going to see Roman Catholic priests, Muslim imams, people of the Baha'i faith, and then a very, very, very prominent Southern Baptist who will take the floor. Remember we were talking about the third leg of the stool? I faith in the modern world as well, because I think this is, in a, in a sense, quite an important thing, because there will be a lot of people who would say, uh, yeah, okay, we agree with all these values, but why faith? Is that a softball question or what? Yeah. A, <laughs> I know that you can handle anything, so I'm going to do that. First, I applaud Davos for having this session, and I applaud okay. you for coming to it. It really says more about you than it does about us. If you are a global business leader, you need to understand that the future of the world is not secularism. It is religious pluralism. You may not like that, but you're going to have to deal with it. The world is becoming more religious, not less. The myth that as education rises, religion would go down, is that literally a myth? And if you happen to be in a country where either houses of worship are not strong, you have no idea of the vitality of faith around the world and see how influential it really is. There are major problems on our planet. I call them the global giants. They affect not millions of people, but billions of people. Pandemic diseases, extreme poverty, illiteracy, corruption, global warming, spiritual emptiness. We cannot solve these problems without involving people of faith and their religious institutions. It isn't going to happen any other way. On this planet, there are about 20 million Jews, 
There are about 600 million Buddhists. There are about 800 million Hindus. There are over 1 billion Muslims. And there are 2.3 billion Christians. If you take people of faith out of the equation, you've ruled out five-sixths of the world. And if we only leave it up to secular people to solve these major problems, it isn't going to happen. Now, I've been coming to Davos for some time, and we always talk about partnerships. And I'm in favor of partnerships, but we've been missing the third leg of the stool. When we talk about partnerships at Davos, we basically talk about public and private, or public being government and non-government organizations, and private meaning the for-profit organizations. A one-legged stool will fall over, and a two-legged stool will fall over. You have to have three legs. And the third leg of the stool are the people representing faiths on this stage and others. It is the faith component. Government has a role that only government can do. Profit has a role that only profit can do. And churches and mosques and synagogues and temples have a role that only they can do. There's some things that churches have. Let me just take my own faith as a, as a Christian pastor. Let me give you some things that government or business will never have that the church has. Uh, number one, we have universal distribution. I could take you to 10 million villages around the world and the only thing in it is a church. They don't have a school, they don't have a business, they don't have a church, I mean a program, they don't have a fire department, they don't have any government, but they got a church. The church was global 200 years before Davos even started talking about globalization. It is truly the only global organization. It speaks more languages than the United Nations. It's in a thousand more people groups than the UN. It is the only truly global organization. So we have universal distribution, and we have used this in disaster relief very effectively. I lead a very small network of about 500,000 churches in 162 countries. That's one little network compared to the Catholic Church, which if you go to uh, Africa, 30% of the health care done on that continent is done by the Catholic Church. You can't ignore that. You, can't, you take the Catholic Church out of Africa, you've just lost the number one provider of, of health care on that, on that continent. Uh, so we have universal distribution. The second thing we have is we have the largest pool of manpower. We could go on and on and on. So, Christian pastors, Roman Catholic priests in hierarchy, Muslim imams, Hindus, have sold out. And they've sold out to what's been told to them is inevitable change. So, you have to remember one thing about the World Economic Forum in the United Nations. They're purpose-driven. So now you have a purpose-driven church. And the purpose is to transform the world. And not transform the world in the way that the Lord Jesus would have it transformed, but have it transformed in a Gnostic, hermetic paradigm. That's where you're going with things. This is a document that came out in 2016. It's called The Role of Faith in Systemic Global Challenges. It's codifying a lot of the things that Rick Warren was just talking about as he sold out the Southern Baptist Convention. The faith factor in employment skills and human capital, and this was actually co-authored by Neil Nielsen, chairman of Lippo Education Initiatives, Lippo Group Indonesia. One of the reasons I bring this up is because it's James Riotti, Stephen Riotti, Mokhtar Riotti, who own Lippo Group. And myself and my colleagues here were involved with Lippo Group about 10, 12 years ago in a project or two. So when I tell you I understand what's going on, I understand what's going on. James Riotti of Lippo Group, prominent supporter of Reformed Evangelical Ministries, Reformed Theological Seminary, Third Millennium Ministries, and others. He also holds a conference each year, of which if you take a, list, a look at the list of pastors and evangelical leaders that he's bringing over to speak for him, and Stephen Tong in Asia, you'll be boggled by what you see. 
He's active in bringing the Reformed faith into Asia through Pastor Stephen Tong. He's a leader and prominent architect of the role of religion at the World Economic Forum. This is James Riotti, and this is in a breakout session that they had at Davos a few years ago. And what you're going to see is, you know how you will have like your plenary speakers and so forth that you have in your main conference, then you have breakouts, right? Well, this was a breakout at Davos about learning about the way that faith can be contributed to the role of the private and public sector. Integralism. So here he is, and of course, all these billionaire elites like to pretend like they're like you and me, and they're just sitting down on soft chairs all together, and they got chalkboards and things. See, they're no different than you. And this is talking about faith solutions, okay? I mean, it's almost silly the way that this is happening, right? This is like what you would do with just a local small group. But faith solutions. So as they have the artists go up on the board and put down what they're going to be talking about in terms of notes, and we talk about faith solutions. Well, what is it? You take a look at the blue down there at the bottom, and this is what it says. How can the public and private sector establish new ways of collaboration with faith communities in a digitally enabled future? Remember we were talking about yesterday, we were going from a digital world into an analog world. How can they collaborate better with faith communities? Well, through integralism. This is leftist integralism, an interpretation of Catholic social teachings, teaching that argues for an authoritarian and anti-pluralist Catholic state. Wherever the preponderance of Catholicism within that society makes this possible, the dominant faith or practice becomes the third leg of the stool, integrated between the authoritarian structure of the state corporate fascist structure. But in many ways, this isn't so much anti-pluralist, it is pluralist. It is pluralist as the way that Rick Warren just talked about. But what is anti-pluralist about it is that if you're not part of their system with the new ways that they're bringing people together in terms of their really bizarre progressive teachings, then you're out. So it isn't really pluralist. If you're in, in terms of teaching social justice, then you can be part of the group promoting the third leg of the stool, the public sector role, private sector role, and a faith sector role. That's what they're doing. The World Economic Forum, the United Nations, and the progressive faith wants to reset Christianity. It's the transmutation of faith. So this is on the document that I was showing you before. So what they're talking is about is solutions, problems, and perspectives. They're kind of putting it out of order. Maybe this is looking a little bit familiar to you. So it talks about the fact that you've got a problem of violent resistance against certain policies, such as birth control and vaccinations. Okay, so what you need to do is you need to get providers of health care, charitable trust, holistic concepts of health, religious communities engaged, like Rick Warren in the Southern Baptist Convention, aid work, prevention, education, and advocacy, focus on sexual and reproductive health and rights and other human rights. So they need to change their perspectives on sexual reproduction and human rights. In other words, keep on with abortion, women's rights, views of the human body, and concepts of sin, guilt, and forgiveness. This is what they're talking about. Now, this is really how it can help you understand it. Remember, we were just here. Remember, we were talking about the dialectic, problem, reaction, solution. This is the way you need to read the document. There's the problem, there's the reaction, and there's the solution. Put a little bit of out of, out of order but you're saying the same thing. It's a dialectic at work. So how does leftist integralism manifest itself? Well, this is Rick Warren and Francis Collins. Who's Francis Collins? He was the head of the National Institutes of Health, who are the ones covering up all the different things with Anthony Fauci and so forth and trying to make sure that certain information didn't get out about COVID and COVID vaccines and so forth. Francis Collins has been working with faith leaders like Rick Warren, like Russell Moore, and others. Let me say a personal word about uh, Dr. Francis Collins. Uh, we have been friends, he and I have been friends for many, many years. I think we first met years ago when we were both speaking at the Davos World Economic Forum. I'm here at Davos with a lot of my friends, and we're talking about what are the biggest problems on the planet and how are we going to solve them. Extreme poverty, 
pandemic diseases, there's a role for uh, the public sector, there's a role for the private sector, and there's a role for the faith sector. Each of them can do something that none of the other three can do. Okay. Are you getting the idea now about what's just happened to you over the past three years? Are you beginning to understand the way that you've been manipulated? So, again, how does leftist integralist, integralism manifest itself in other ways? Let's not just look at healthcare and so forth. Let's look at what they're doing in terms of pushing ideologies. This is from the Presbyterian Church in America. Okay? These are basically where you would have the president of the Southern Baptist Convention lead the convention each, each year. You would as well have these next two gentlemen that were leading the PCA in their conventions. You ready? He was the 45th uh, moderator. This is Alexander Yoon. And what's fascinating to me is if you know anything about critical race theory, right? This is a concept in, that I would apply in, in education. I consider myself a critical race theorist. Um, you can be, and a Christian at the same time, yes. Uh, but I confess the same to you, that I'm not just, that I'm not a recovered racist. I'm a recovering racist, just as, dare I say it, you are, everyone. Just as none of us can say, I'm a recovered sinner, and now I live the victorious Christian life. We're recovering. See, you're never living the victorious Christian life with this heresy. You're always going to have to be in the process of, re, of, of reforming, if you will. The World Economic Forum's role of faith project is very concerned with the prosperity gospel that is popular in many Pentecostal churches. Not because the World Economic Forum is concerned about theological purity, but because the World Economic Forum is introducing equity-based socialism as the world's new economic model. So when you have all of these different faith leaders. They're like, oh, the prosperity gospel and so forth. And look, you can have disagreements with it and say, I don't believe that that's biblical. But why do they spend all their time on it? Because what they're trying to introduce is socialism. They're trying to introduce distributism. They're trying to change your focus on what you should value or not value. And what you should value is, of course, being poor and having less. It's a degrowth model. So again, you have the problem, reaction, solution. The problem is traditionalism and conservatism, patriarchal, slow-changing structures. And the reaction is that freedom of religion can help improve conditions for women. So you want those faith perspectives that kind of destroy our hierarchical boundaries that we have that are biblical. So you want to have, as a solution, progressive communities, important role models that are women or trans. Strong, enabling networks for change. Focus on women and children in local and international social work. Work with gender roles and gender justice. Problem, reaction, solution. For instance, this is one of our past Southern Baptist presidents that we had named J.D. Greer. Everybody was celebrating, well, he's reformed. It's great that he's going to be in. Well, this is him talking back to Beth Moore. And if you didn't know, Beth went completely woke. Okay? Completely socialist. This is J.D. Greer saying, thank you, Beth, hoping that we are entering a new era where we in the complementarian world take all the word of God seriously, not just the parts about distinction of roles, but also R.E., the tearing down of all hierarchy and his gracious distribution, distributism, of gifts to all of his children. So the World Economic Forum's role of faith project is very concerned with transforming current societal hierarchies and will use faith leaders who are willing to prostitute themselves, ignore clear teaching of scripture, and create a cultural revolution in the church. So you heard a lot of people complaining about Rick Warren because he was having female pastors at his church, but you didn't hear about the rest of this, did you? That's because a lot of other faith leaders were involved with this as well. The church is being used as a tool for change in the transitioning world. What you are watching is the normalization of Gnosticism. So this is regarding Gnosticism. This is from Irenaeus of Lyon. And he lived between AD 130 and AD 202. Okay? And he says this about Gnosticism. 
Error indeed is never set forth in its naked deformity, lest, being thus exposed, it should at once be detected. On the contrary, it dresses elegantly so that the unwary may be led to believe that it is more true than truth itself. So, in other words, that the error mass itself as being more true than even truth itself. That it's more Christian than the Christian that you used to believe in. You can see that happening both on the left and the right. Both with what's happening in woke Christianity and as well what's happening now with what it calls Christian nationalism. So, when you're looking at the Gnostic concepts, this is from the Gospel of Philip, which is a Gnostic heretical document. And in these documents, it says the world came into, into being through a mistake. This is from the Gospel of Thomas, another Gnostic gospel that should be rejected from the canon completely. It said, Simon Peter said to him, let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life, Jesus said. I myself shall lead her in order to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit, resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Transgenderism is not a new thing. This is a second century document. The theology of Gnosticism was based on a particular type of dualism called anti-cosmicism, which means that the Gnostics were against anti, okay, anti, the world, cosmos. They believed that matter and the spiritual were antithetical to one another. Instead, true spirituality consisted of escaping the bonds of this earthly prison by awakening to the transcendent divinity that lies hidden within oneself. In other words, what you are physically is not really what you are spiritually. It's the opposite. Because you see, this physical world is demonic. What you are is everything is opposite in the spiritual world, which today we're being made into the digital world where you can avatar anything you want to be. But then if you can both make happen what you are in the digital world, what you are in the physical world, and get little children to cut off their genitals, to try to have surgeries to change themselves, now you're really doing the right thing. That's where we are. Neo-Gnosticism, the religion of our day, tells young men and women that they must liberate themselves from their physical prisons, their demiurgical prisons, to become women if they're men, and tells women that they must liberate themselves from their physical prisons to become men. That's why this is happening. This is not new. What did we read at the beginning from Ecclesiastes 1? There is nothing new under the sun. It's the same heresy brought into a digital modern world, postmodern world, I should say. I'm going to close with this. I can't believe this happened. I ruined my life. Um, when you break it down, I decided that I didn't want to be a woman before I had ever even experienced being a woman. I had no idea what being a woman was like because I was a child. And um, now I feel like I will never entirely know. Um, <clears throat> I I want to say that I really feel like some people in the trans community and the trans medicalists and the doctors really, really target the most vulnerable of us. I have borderline personality disorder, and I know for a fact that this is the reason for my transition. Um, it's a very difficult mental illness. And uh, one of the core features is not having any sense of self or identity. And um, my doctors knew this. Um, I, I told them, even though they didn't ask, um, that I had been diagnosed with BPD. Um, and it was all fine to them. I wasn't happy as a girl, so that meant I was a boy and I was trans. And so... I I just um took the cure that was handed to me. Um I I was told that I was being given a cure 
and I I wouldn't want to kill myself anymore. Um, and it wasn't true. No, <laughs> I didn't want to cry in this video, but this is such a hard thing to talk about. I, um, I lost a lot of things to this, and I just hope that anyone else who's going through what I went through as a young girl will not be prescribed hormones and surgery because of other things. Um, you know, there are so many mental health disorders that make you hate your body, and the solution isn't to change your body, it's to fix your brain, you know? Um, I just don't want anyone else to ever feel this way. I lost my voice. I lost my chest. I don't know if I'm going to be able to have kids. Um, I feel like no one wants to date me or love me because I'm ruined. The gospel has to come to her as well. When we just mock those that are caught up in this cult, in this Gnostic cult, in the trans movement or whatever the case may be, we have to be self-sacrificial and bring the gospel of grace, of love, of hope to those that are hopeless those that are now imprisoned because of what someone convinced them to do that would basically end their normal life. Church, we have a job to do. And it's to love those who are completely unloved and feel as if there is no chance for happiness, for hope, for salvation in their lives. But there are those who would tell us that, nope, what you need to do is separate from those people. Keep your kids away from them. I agree. You need to protect your children. But we also need to bring the gospel. And if we isolate ourselves, put ourselves in our own safe zones, and are not able to come into the communities where this is happening, then we are doing tremendous damage to the cause of Christianity and the gospel, and as well to human liberty, freedom, and objective truth. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time this morning.